All right. Welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is Martin Luther King Day. What is that? January 15th. Welcome, everybody. Let's uh, give a, uh, a uh, send our love out to Martin Luther King. And uh, I hope you guys are all doing good. I hope you had a great weekend. This is episode number 732 of Let There Be Talk. And today it is brought to you by Standard and Strange, my fantastic sponsor, your one-stop shop for all of your denim, leather, and boots. Located in New York City, Berkeley, and New Mexico, or online at standardandstrange.com, or check them on Instagram, Standard and Strange. Tell them I sent you, Jeremy and Neil, do yourself a favor and head into that shop and lose your mind. All right, it is uh, Monday. And uh, like every Monday, I am happy that you join me here and uh, tune in and follow Let There Be Talk. Gertie is right now over here going cuckoo with the blanket. I want to give a shout out right now to past sponsors. I realized the podcast has been going for 12 years and there were some very key sponsors over the years that really helped the show. And I just want to give them a thank you after all these years. Uh, just incredible. First up, way back in the day, Earthquaker Devices, Stomp Boxes, Handmade out there in Ohio, Land of Devo. They were one of the very first sponsors of this podcast. And uh, uh, I just absolutely love those people. So Earthquaker Devices, McGuire Harley Davidson. They were a big, big sponsor early on and just fantastic. And uh, I love them. If you're out in the Bay Area, get your Harley at McGuire Harley Davidson. And then El Cajon came in for a solid two year sponsor. My man, Greg Riley, just fantastic. El Cajon Harley over the years. Catatonic. Not only was he a great sponsor, but he made all those cool stickers over the years. So uh, shout out to them. And then the one that kept me alive during COVID, CBD Lion. Remember them? Still around. Still got the great CBD. I still use the creams on my neck. CBD Lion. And uh, there you go, man. Those are some of the fantastic sponsors of the past. And I just felt like I wanted to give them a shout out today. All those guys really helped the show over the years. Okay. Let's dive into the show. It's a solo episode today. And I want to get a, a lot of uh, stuff in here I want to cover. The first thing I want to cover is a huge thank you to everybody that came out to the Bon Scott Tribute. Once again, it was absolutely next level. And uh, this time, I will say this, the audience was electric. This is definitely the best audience we've had. It was sold out, and the audience was just fucking rocking. They were way into the comedy, just seated, listening, no fucking buffoons out there. Everybody was laughing. I popped Jim Florentine onto the show last minute. He happened to be in town. So that was amazing to have him with us. He did a, a 10 minute set. Then I came out, did 15 minutes. And then uh, the great Bill Burr came on, did about 25 or 30. And then we cleared the stage or not the stage, but the seats and uh, started up the rock concert and the crowd was going crazy. We were doing a whole lot of Rosie. And if you are familiar with the, if you want blood record, they do the old da -na 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 -na, and the crowd was chanting Angus, Angus, Angus. It was amazing. The Jack, we did the classic breakdown. She's got the Jack. She's got the Jack, you know? And then TNT, they were coming strong on the oi, 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 oi. The audience just fucking killed. 
man, thank you so much. And uh, it was really cool to see the mix of people out there. It was uh, hipsters. There were women at the show. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? And there were just pure, fierce ACDC fans. So we had this great, great mixture. We had the fans out there with the lit up Angus you know, horns that the ACDC hands out at the shows. That was fucking cool to see those. I'm out there singing, looking around. You just see those horns all lit up. We had just people up front head banging and rocking and singing all the lyrics. It was the perfect, perfect crowd. Not only that, but um, the venue, once again, is one of the stars of this show. The Avalon Theater, I, I got to give them a shout out and just tons of love. And my man Fabrice that helped me uh, set this up years ago inside the Avalon. The Avalon is just as big a star as anybody on that stage, man. They fucking kill it. That room with the, the incredible screens that we can put up the photos of Bon Scott, making it look like just this museum a Bon Scott ACDC museum. And then at the end of the night, I had the photo of my mom and myself behind us on Night Prowler. Everything worked out flawlessly. This show, if one thing goes wrong, I'm running the whole show, everything. I rent the room, the chairs, the rehearsals, uh, the equipment, the catering, everything. If one thing goes wrong, the fucking wheels could fall off. So it was flawless. So shout out to the Avalon. And then most of all, shout out to the audience and the uh, players that are involved. I, like I said, the audience was great, but holy shit, did the players come through this year. Mike Inez from Allison in Chains on bass. Billy Rowe from Buck Cherry on rhythm guitar. Scott Ian on also rhythm guitar from Anthrax. Josh Z playing the Angus mode all night, other than when our great friend Lur from Primus comes out and smokes it. Then we got uh, Dave Lombardo on drums. Bill Burr killing it this year on the drums. Girls Got Rhythm and What's Next to the Moon. Just killing it on Girl Scott Rhythm and Next to the Moon. I'm rough on what's next to the moon. I've only sang it one time ever in my life, and that was when we did the Power Age record. It's a hard song to sing if you haven't sang it, not vocally, but just mentally, trying to remember how it goes and and all the this weird timing. It's weird timing for me, you know. And you find my baby to the railroad train. It's just weird how it comes in. But uh, Bill absolutely crushed it. And uh, hats off to him. He also murdered it in the comedy world there on at the show, beginning of the show. Then Josh Freese. Oh, my God. Foo Fighters in every band ever, as the poster would say. He came on. He played uh, Highway to Hell. And Dirty Deeds. I think it was Dirty Deeds, yeah. And then Juliet Lewis. A lot of people, I'm going to give a rundown of what happened. Juliet Lewis couldn't make it because there was a huge storm the night before in the East Coast. And she was out doing one of those comic cons somewhere and basically got stuck in an airport in New Orleans for 12 hours. So here comes our uh, our as 49ers would say, our Purdy into the game. Pearl, who's Scott Ian's uh, wife and daughter of the great Meatloaf, she comes in and covers the spot of Juliet Lewis and sings Dirty Deeds and absolutely fucking crushes it. And check out her band that she does with Scott, Motor Sister. And uh, thank you, Pearl. Wow. Just come out there and just rock it. Looking dynamite, sounding dynamite, and just delivering it. Everybody was fired up for her. And then, um, so yeah, Josh Freeze, Dave Lombardo, Burr, and then the incredible Steve Gorman, formerly of the Black Crows, 
the bag men band now and trigger hippie and also uh killing it in the morning radio world out there in minneapolis which by the way i will be at acme comedy club in minneapolis in march please get your tickets ahead of time i am trying to pack these shows at acme because uh it's an honor to play this room first time in my uh, 14 years of comedy i'm getting a headline in so steve gorman and then uh am i missing anybody fuck i can't stay oh i want to tell you what happened so one guy he he instagram dad no no jay buchanan or scott holiday from rival sons rip off First of all, when you book this show or when I book it, I always say line up subject to change because shit happens like Juliet couldn't make it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me get a little water here. And then um, Scott Holiday, the morning of the show, his family had the flu all week and he was trying to dodge it, sleeping in the garage and stuff. <laughs> And then uh, sure enough, he ended up getting the flu the morning of the show and couldn't come do it. Totally bummer because he had played it before and killed. And then Jay Buchanan booked himself, but also was booked to do the uh, music festival out in Cabo San Lucas. Mm. And uh, didn't realize that he had to fly out the same day as the show. He thought he was flying out the following day. So that's what happened with them. But everybody picks up the pieces and you just keep going. And I'll tell you what, it couldn't have gone smoother. Unbelievable. I also want to give a shout out to uh, some of the people, the photographers that handled this. Uh, Ronnie Lyon, Steve Rose, and Troy Conrad. These guys took some insane photos that you've seen all over the internet in the last week. And uh, they are just as you know big a part of the show as anybody because he, they capture just unreal photos of this night that are magic. And they all have a different style when it comes to photography. So it's really cool to see each style. A lot of times you do a show, they got one photographer, you see it, you got one look and yeah, they're fucking great. But to have three different styles, Troy Conrad being the black and white master, and then uh, Steve Rose, just been shooting every rock show in the last 10 years. And then Ronnie Lyme, who's uh, yeah, been on the podcast, so is Steve Rose, so is Troy Conrad. But Ronnie Lyon shoots all those big, badass surf competitions down there in uh, Orange County. And uh, he kills it. He's used to action photos. So thank you to them. What a night, though. I'm going to read you the set list in case you don't follow me on Instagram, because a lot of people are like, what was the set list? Okay, here it is right here. We opened with Livewire. Then we went TNT, Riff Raff, Bad Boy Boogie, Rosie, Walk All Over You, What's Next to the Moon, uh, Dirty Deeds, Highway to Hell, The Jack, oh, Dave Lombardo played the Jack. When are you going to hear the master of double bass come in and just lay down a badass groove to the Jack? Oh, my God. The guy's got it all. Um, Kicked in the teeth again, which is personally my favorite one to sing besides Let the Be Rock, which came next. Let the Be Rock and then Night Prowler. I love closing with Night Prowler because you got that fucking kabonk of Let There Be Rock, full force. And of course, most bands would just leave with that. Thank you. Good night. After Let There Be Rock. But you come back out and you just lay down Night Prowler and get everybody into that mood of like, we're winding down the night with one of the most fucking heavy ACDC jams of all time, Night Prowler. I really cannot stress enough how great it was to see all kinds of friends out there that came out for this, that flew out from all around the world, actually. My buddy Tommy, uh, Patreon Tommy, flew out from Ireland for the gig. 
Richard, my buddy from uh, Patreon also, he flew out from Ohio, I think he lives, or somewhere out there, Kansas City. My man Britt, one of my oldest friends, Britt on the boat, played in his band for a little bit. He came out with a group. He brought like eight people. We had Del James there, uh, who famously wrote songs with Testament and worked with the uh, Axel Rose and Guns N' Roses now for the last fucking 30 years or something. And speaking of Guns N' Roses, we had Frank, the GNR drummer there. And somebody came out that has not been out in the wild that I know of in a hundred years. Frank Wilsey from the great, great Sea Hags. Oh my God. Dying to get him on the podcast. I think it'll happen. A lot of good friends. I want to give a huge shout out to 1986 Tacos, who catered the event and just brought those killer fucking tacos to a backstage, everyone back there. And Kai Aarons for the incredible poster. So I just want, oh, Alicia was there, another Patreoner, a great, great, great friend. And I'm uh, just looking right, right here real quick, did the set list, shout out to my mom uh yeah that looks like it like i said I, I mean i could talk about this show for days because it's so magical but um thank you everybody thank you for coming out and thank you everybody for supporting the show speaking of uh steve gorman he of course no longer plays in the black crows and you know if you're like me you absolutely worship Steve Gorman in the Black Crows. And I saw them, uh, you know, uh, of, above over 50, 60, 70 times. I've talked about it many times, Black Crows being one of my favorite bands of all time. And I've recently been uh, listening to them quite a bit again. I am not a guy who harps on the um, old lineup because uh if you don't like the lineup, then just don't go. It's that easy. I uh, I love them and I capture their uh, memories in my mind and relive them many times. There's been just fucking nothing but happy times seeing that band live and listening to that band and the influence that they had on me back when I played music. And now I I, I don't sit around and talk about the lineup anymore because it's a, it's a dead horse. But... Um, you know, I love that era and that's good. I, I got other bands now. I got Marcus King. I got Neil Francis. I've got all kinds of great music. All them witches. I've got fucking 50, 60 bands I listen to right now that get me high like the Black Crows did during that era. There's no use of talking about it. And uh, I've gone over it again. But they dropped a new song on Friday. It was Thursday night at midnight, Friday morning, from an upcoming record that's coming out March 15th, which happens to be my mom's birthday. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they uh, put together. The last thing they did was that 70s covers record. And uh, this is a four, uh, first full length in many, many years. And the song that came out, let me see, what was it called here? Wanting and Waiting. The record is called Happy Happiness Bastards, March 15th coming out. And the song is Wanting and Waiting, like I said. And I will tell you this right now, is uh, really, really about 100% flavor of the By Your Side record. It sounds like the song By Your Side, but sped up. Go listen to them back to back. I did it. And uh, which, by the way, By Your Side, after all this time, is a very underrated record. Of course, it's the first one without Mark Ford from the Southern Harmony all the way out. They were wearing those white suits. It was a new label. And John Klogner was trying to get them back into the big first album flavor. And uh, there's some hits and misses on there, but great stuff like uh, By Your Side, uh, which I love, Horsehead, Unbelievable, Only a Fool, and um, Diamond Rings, great. Virtue and Vice is great. There's a lot of good stuff on there. This single, I don't know if the whole record is going to sound uh, like that flavor, 
But this single is 100% by your side. It sounds uh, like that era. So that'll be coming out. We, uh, we will see what happens. Still have never had Chris Robinson on the podcast. I'm not quite sure if he, uh, you know, I talked to him at Power Trip, asked him to do it, and uh, DM'd his uh, wife to see if we could get him on the show. Has not happened. Who knows? He may uh, he may not want to do it because I'm close with uh, Steve Gorman. You never know. I'm sure uh, that might be something to do with it. Who knows? Maybe he has no fucking idea. I've met him probably 10 times. And uh, we've talked every time quite a bit uh, extensively about music or whatever. But he has never been on. But that's fine, you know what I mean? Because uh, I don't want to have them on and then be like, oh, hey, what about that? And I'd be like, nah, fuck that. So who knows? It might be better. His brother was fantastic. He's been on the podcast twice. And the first time he was on, it was real, real deep and a, a great, great, intricate uh, interview about the entire history of Black Crows. This was before he was playing with Chris again. So who knows? But uh, at least they're making some new music and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that. So that's uh, March 15th. Give him a little shout out there. Uh, another couple things that happened over the week while we were uh, out there living our lives. Rage Against the Machine. Of course, everybody knows that's one of my favorite bands of all time, which, by the way, yesterday I heard um, I hadn't heard in a long time. Some Kings of Leon came on Sirius XM. And Kings of Leon being one of my favorite bands of the last 20 years, they were really in that incredible era where rock and roll was happening again of the strokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kings of Leon, that whole thing. Uh, Interpool, see you in the bathroom. That whole era of New York flavor, rock and roll that exploded at Kings of Leon fucking catapulted. I had Jakir King on who produced my record and produced that giant uh, Sex on Fire era of Kings of Leon. I hadn't heard him in a while. And whenever that happens, I'm always like, fuck, this is so goddamn good. And it was one of those bands, we've said it before, uh, Jakir and I were talking, they got so big that all of a sudden the, the hipster crowd was like, nah, fuck them. And then the soccer moms were like, we love them, but soccer moms just move on. They're the people that are like, what happened to the wallflowers? Whatever happened to uh, Kings of Leon? What happened to Black Crows? They had that She Talks to Angels. I really like that. When I'm sipping some wine with the ladies. <laughs> that sounds like Burr there. Ladies. But, uh, you know, when you hear something like Kings of Leon, you fucking dive back in and you just go, holy shit, this band kills. They have so many great songs. And if you haven't seen that documentary on Kings of Leon, do yourself a favor. Anyway, um, I was, what was I talking about? I got sidetracked. On, oh, the rage against the machine. <laughs> so uh, Brad Wilk, he did an Instagram post. Let me get this real quick. So I just have it right here because uh, I felt for him. He is a good, good friend of mine. And we have a lot of personal conversations, private conversations that I never talk about because uh, I don't talk about stuff on my podcast that I talk to people about on the phone because there's a a very, very uh, big line there in the sand that if they call me and go, hey, man, uh, if you want to talk about this on the podcast, I have them on. I let them talk about it. But if somebody calls me on the phone and has some personal conversations with me, I don't bring it up on the show. So a lot of the rage stuff over the last couple of years, I've known about. And I, I just, I don't need to talk about it. It's not, uh, it's not my place to talk about it. Somebody reached out to me on uh, Twitter and 
when Brad made the announcement. They said, what do you think about this team? You got any insight on it? And I was like, nah, I'm not giving you any inside. But here it is. Here's what Brad posted. I know a lot of people are waiting for us to announce new tour dates for all the canceled Rage Against the Machine shows. I don't want to string people or myself along any further. So while there may have been some communication that this may be happening in the future, I want to let you know that Rage Against the Machine, Tim, Zach, Tom, and myself, will no longer be touring or playing live again. I'm sorry for those of you who have been waiting for this to happen. I really wish it was. I will tell you this right now. And I've said this many times about Rage Against the Machine. Rage Against the Machine, you live by the danger, you die by the danger. And that's how it is, man. Look at bands all the way back. Sex Pistols, dangerous, crazy, gone. The Clash, dangerous, authentic, radical, gone. Um, you know, anytime you have a, it, it happened to GNR for a long time. They were basically just Axel and nobody else because people are like, I can't handle Axel. Yeah, well, you can handle these people when they're in the band and they're authentic and radical, but it will combust. And that's why they're so fucking good. And uh, that's why I always say, fuck you to anybody out there that's like, oh man, they're fucking $200 tickets and fucking, they have fucking phonies and they're raging with the machine and just all of that bullshit. Some guy fucking came on my Twitter, just a fucking moron, has no idea the backstory. And it's like, look, they're not playing because fucking they're a radical group. And when they get together, it fucking starts to combust on each other. That's a hard animal to wrangle. It's like playing in a band with four fucking bulls those wild bulls the, the running of the bulls you know when you see that coming down and people get fucking hit they're trying to cross or run with the bulls and they get mowed over or they get a fucking horn into their side stabs them that's what it's like to play with four radical dudes in your band or even if you have one radical dude you're going to have the fucking running of the bulls. You get them on a tour bus and they all want to run. And that's just the fucking truth. And that's why they're not playing. Because it's crazy. It's radical. It's authentic. And it probably is not supposed to be around more than a couple years. We're lucky that we got what we got from Rage Against the Machine. We are lucky that we got fucking evil empire. We are lucky that we got the first record. You know, we're lucky we have records from them, live footage that we could go back and watch and just go, look at the fire in those fuckers eyes. I don't think they've ever, ever punched in live on stage. It is impossible. And I also know after singing that Bon Scott show, at 57, going to be 58 here, February 3rd. I don't know how old Zach is. I think he's 52. That for Zach to fire up that fucking fire and go out and and perform like he performs. Look at he fucking fucked up his leg like the second show of the tour and was still fire sitting on a road case. Man, so, you know, I always focus on the positive. Look what we got. Bon Scott, real deal, gone. Fucking gone. Real deal people, man. You can't wrangle their emotions. They're not fake. When you hear those lyrics or those performances, they're not fake. The fake shit, you can spot it. You can smell it a mile away. I smell it. 
a mile away. I smell fake people all the time. So I have a hard time faking it around fake people. And it's probably held me back over the years. I can smell bullshit a mile away. I see someone, I'm like, this guy's jive, you know? And uh, like I said, I don't really have it in me to go, oh, cool, man. Yeah, a shake and fake. I just don't have that. And that's probably why I'm at where I'm at. But I feel fucking good about myself. And I feel like I'm gaining my way to the 1,000 true fans. And each night I lay around going, God damn, I do comedy. I do a podcast. And I make some people happy out there. It's fucking great. And that's, you know, Rage Against the Machine. They made a lot of us happy. We've got the music. Turn it up and fucking fire it off and enjoy it. Thank you for the time. I am bummed. I did not get to see that last run. Um, you know, but I saw the last giant show in LA years and years ago there at the LA Coliseum with uh, the Muse and Lauren Hill. I still got that great, great memory. People lighting the fucking AstroTurf on fire. The power went out. I, for about five minutes, did think, oh, we're going to have a fucking riot in here. This is going to be scary. Rick Rubin to the right of me, Ian Edwards to the left. Power went out. Fires were burning. Plastic AstroTurf smell going into my lungs, taking me out. Taking me out, motherfucker. <laughs> anyway, my most in, uh, important thing, my most biggest concern is my friend Brad. Because, you know, they can't do Audio Slave. Chris Cornell is gone. And they can't do Rage now. And these players are fucking unreal. Brad is one of the best drummers I've ever jammed with. And he's one of the greatest humans I've ever hung out with. So shout out to Brad Will. I fucking love you, buddy. All right. Next up, I was surfing the Instagram as I do for about 23 hours and six minutes a day. And a video came up. And man, do I fucking love music and comedy, you know? just surfing around, laughing at fucking old Sanford and Son clips. And then a music clip comes up of like, uh, you know, uh, Rainbow Rising Dio era or a Scorpions Uli Roth era. And then a fucking sick ass leather jacket will come up. Anyway, there I am fucking flicking and sticking. And uh, this video comes up of this white dude. And it's, and it's a white dude next to Quincy Jones. And Quincy Jones is probably about, I don't know, 35, maybe 30. And he's really young. They're on a couch. And it says, uh, Rod Temperton demos of Off the Wall and uh, Rock With You. And I was like, what? Now, I've said this many, many, many times. And I got in an argument just recently. I argue this all the time. I got an argument with uh, Keith Robinson, one of the funniest fucking guys. Can't wait for his special to come out. He shot it at Sony Hall. Marcus Price directed it. Should be out soon on Netflix. Keith is uh, one of my mentors. Uh, definitely taught me a lot about New York comedy and the New York comedy scene and the New York comedy history. And uh, we argued there at the comics table over Prince versus Michael Jackson. This has been a uh, argument that people have had for many, many, many years. And I always say Prince mostly because to me, Prince writes, records, and produces really everything he ever did. He plays every instrument. He writes every lyric. He writes every fucking note of that song. He sings it all. He he tours like, he, well, he toured like mad. And Michael 
wrote some stuff, didn't play any instruments, not quite sure how he wrote it. They showed how he wrote stuff like Billy Jean, where he would just be like, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. and then the guy with the instrument would be over there. Oh, you mean like this? Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, that's about right. Da -da -da -da. Billy Jean. But as a, my point is, I'm looking at this guy and they're playing a demo that he recorded of uh, Rock With You. You know, that one, I'm gonna rock with you all night. Off the wall record, which is fucking fantastic. And I go, holy shit, look at this guy. Who is this guy? And then I Google it. He was one of the founding members of Heat Wave, which I realize uh, as I was listening to this and then dove back down into the heat wave rabbit hole, heat wave being one of the all time favorites of mine that I would uh, call. And so would my man Fletch roller skink, roller skink, roller skate rock. Meaning when I was in about the sixth, seventh and eighth grade, hanging at the roller rink, heat wave would come on and it would fucking be on. And Heat Wave is definitely one of the most underrated R&B groups of all time. Disco, R&B, they're right up there with Earth, Wind & Fire to me. And when you really think about it, nobody knows who's in Heat Wave, which is wild. And uh, nobody really talks about Heat Wave. So I want to recommend to you right now to go listen to three Heat Wave records. So he was the keyboard player in Heat Wave and the songwriter. And uh, there were two brothers that were singers, which was Johnny and Keith. And these guys are unbelievable. Johnny Wilder, Keith Wilder. Their rhythm guitar player, the first year, first record, got fucking stabbed to death, I think in Chicago or something. But they put these records together. And they were fucking masterpieces of disco and R&B. Just the hits alone, which is Boogie Nights, the way that comes in. Boogie Nights, it's all right, you did come to party. Just two brothers up front singing the shit out of these songs. The rest of the guys are playing the instruments. Real guitar, bass, keyboards, drums, Real singing, unfucking real, right up there with Earth, Wind, and Fire to me. 100%. They had the song Groove Line that blows my mind every time I hear it. Always and Forever. But they had all these deeper tracks that were semi hits that really killed. So I want you to go listen to their records and lose your fucking mind. All right. So too Hot to Handle, 1976. That's got Boogie Nights on it, but it's got a bunch of other great songs, including, including Always and Forever. 78, Central Heating. Great record with heat, uh, with Groove Line and a bunch of stuff. Um, then the uh, Hot Property, which came out, I think, at 79. And it had a tune on there that really reminded me of the skating rink. I bond. We're going eyeballing. Ba, da, da. We're going eyeballing. I mean, this shit is fucking unreal. But after 79, the guy starts writing tunes like crazy. He writes on the off the wall record, three fucking songs. And then Quincy Jones asks him to come in and write again on fucking Thriller. He writes Thriller, him alone, Thriller. And I'm telling you, man, this guy is the Michael Jackson secret weapon. They called him the invisible man because he wanted no fucking fame. I'm sure he realized what fame does to you. Look at Michael Jackson, you know what I mean? Paparazzi and all of that shit in the seventies where they pop out of a bush while you're at fucking Studio 54 snorting a line of coke. They're like, look at you. And then you're down on the fucking mirror doing a blast. 
It's insane. The Invisible Man. He's from the UK originally. Lived out there with his wife. Died way too fucking early. 66 years old. Died of cancer. I am telling you, man, this guy, he wrote hits for all kinds of fucking people. They say he has second most hits from Lennon McCartney in the UK. Check this out. He wrote George Benson's Give Me the Night. All right, all right. Give Me the Night. This guy could write perfect R&B disco tunes that are played every fucking day right now on the 70s channel, on Sirius XM, and all over the FM dial. This guy wrote so many hits. It is crazy that he wrote Thriller, and I never even knew that. Unbelievable. Rod Temperton. I don't even know if he's in the fucking Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but he needs to be in there, man. The band came out in 1975, Heat Wave. Just unreal. And, and Johnny, the singer, and his brother Keith, these guys are fucking soldiers of disco, man. Just uh, go in YouTube. There's live footage of them all over YouTube. Watch them play Groove Line. Watch them play Boogie Nights. It is so fucking cool, man, to watch these guys. The guitar playing is killer. It's like, oh my God. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because Heat Wave, I don't feel like enough people talk about this group. And, and like I said, man, listen to the whole records all the way through. I was just looking at this right here. Let me get this here. It is crazy how fucking good these guys are. I was firing it off all weekend, you know, after uh, doing an onslaught of ACDC. Uh, check out this song, man, on um, Central Heating. Let's see. Hold on. Let me get this. Sorry, guys. Actually, sorry. Listen to this song, which is, by the way, awful album cover. Going up there with the awful album cover uh, top awards. Hot Property, their 1979 record, just an awful album cover. It is, it is up there with the Mother Hips. Uh, uh, what was that Mother Hips record? I I hated the cover on it. Fuck, I forget. God damn, my brain ain't working right now. <clears throat> anyway, listen to the song on uh, Hot Property. Go out and check out All Talked Out. So fucking good. They got a track just straight up called Disco. I love it. Anyway, God, what an awful cover. Central Heating, just a great, great record. I okay. I've talked about them enough, but I just I just can't stress it enough, man. Go dig into that shit right there. Um let's see here. Uh sorry. Um I, I, sorry, I got a I uh, just got a text from the comedy store. I'm at the store tonight, so I'm just uh, looking at their text. Speaking of that, tour dates. Brand new ones coming out. Palm Springs, February with uh, Bill Burr, two nights. And then uh, Portland, Oregon with Burr in February. Uh, Vancouver and Salt Lake City. Looking forward to those dates. Brand new Bill Burr dates just hit the... Uh, hit the uh, website and also um, what was the other one? Um, sorry. I'm fucking Denver. I'm doing Denver with Burr. So there's some uh, great tour dates coming up. And I, like I said, I can't stress enough. Come see me at uh, Colorado at Fort Collins at the comedy fort and go see me at Acme at the, um, at the blah, 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 at the, um, in Minneapolis. I <laughs> fucking sidetracked it. Okay. New Patreoners, Lee Martin, Tim Porter, um, Ryfax. I want to shout out Ryfax came to the fucking Bon Scott Tribune. And Ryfax has been such a great fucking supporter, uh, a solid Del Razor. 
could be top five right there. Lee Martin, thank you for joining the Patreon. And once again, Frank Barnacki, thanks for that great donation. And Co Corey Hansen. Um, all right. I think that is about it. I love all you guys. And um, I don't want to say anything right now because every time I do, it doesn't happen. But in the next four weeks, if everything goes right, there is some fucking guests coming on the show that are going to knock you out. Okay. And uh, one of them has never been on the fucking show before. So I just want to give you guys a heads up on that. And I want to thank you. Have a great Martin Luther King Day. And fuck Arizona for not recognizing the Martin Luther King Day for years. I think they are now, but man, they didn't used to. And that was just fucking, no, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know what's wrong with people. I don't. I don't. But I love you guys. Spread the love. Spread the word of the podcast. Leave a review on iTunes, please. And subscribe to the YouTube channel. I love you guys. See ya. Candles are lit.